All right, all right. Welcome to Marathon 117, 100, 100, 100, 117. I've got three, uh, two real long stories and one, I don't know, kind of medium stories, but they're all three fantastic. The last one, all three of them are equally good. Okay, so I'm just going to shut up. We're going to roll on with the video. Hey, don't forget about t-shirts. I'm rolling a few pictures here of some of the new t-shirts we have up on our Teespring store. If you guys are interested in Christmas t-shirts with Bigfoot on them, these are really cute. They're in all kind of colors. The image is on the front of the t-shirt. I think all my other t-shirts, the image is on the back with a logo on the front breast. These are just no logo, just a cool image of Bigfoot and Merry Christmas on the front. Take a look at them in my Teespring store. They look good. Right now, there's a 10% discount if you use the discount code Dixie10. 10% off of everything in the store. So go check that out. All right, let's roll on with this video. All right, here we go. <laughs> The writer of this story wants to be anonymous, and here's what he writes. My father's uncle lived with us for the last 10 or so years of his long life. His name was Zebulon Jedediah Butler. We called him Uncle Zeb. Given the choice he had with regards to his name, I would have chosen to be called Jed, but that's just me. He died at the age of 101, seemingly of nothing other than longevity. He went to sleep one night, and when we woke, he was dead. It was my 11th birthday, and it was not the kind of present that I wanted, but that's just the way he was. Uncle Seb will never die in my mind. He will always be with me wherever I might go. When I'm sitting on my front porch in the swing drinking a glass of iced tea, I think about him and the stories that he used to tell us kids. We all sat on this very same porch many memorable times and listened as he took us on a tour of the world that he grew up in. Many of the locations he spoke of are the same places that surround us now, but the pictures in my mind from that time put reality to shame. His stories were packed with life lessons and humor, sometimes intended and sometimes not, but always greatly entertaining. Thinking back on it, if that old man did half the crap he said he did, he made Huck Finn look like a shut-in. I loved him and I miss him even now, some 50 years after he decided he'd had enough living and left us. I go visit his grave now and then, and I almost expect to see a finger stick out above his grave and wiggle. That hasn't happened yet, I emphasize, yet, because I know that rascal's down there in that box most likely bored enough to try anything. I'm not 100% sure if he can see or hear me, but if I get a new shotgun or a knife, I take it by to show it to him. On one or two occasions, I've taken my prized possession with me so he can see that I still have his old bolt-action twenty-two rifle. Here is one of Uncle Zeb's stories. It centers around a small waterfall in one of the many streams that drain Lookout Mountain. Just a few miles up the road from my house, there is an unused logging road that ascends the south ridge of the mountain. The road splits about halfway up, and if you turn left, you continue on to the top of the ridge and connect with what locals call the JFK Trail. I suppose the concession of the name was made for funding purposes, unlikely that it was due to the popularity of JFK himself with local folks. If you turn right where the road splits, you go about 50 feet and you cross a small stream that spans the road and then pours over a waterfall about 15 feet high. The first time I ever saw this waterfall, I was eight or nine years old, and I went there with my dad and Uncle Zeb in my dad's old military jeep. In those days, the road was actually in fair condition and the only real hindrance was overhanging limbs that seemed to delight in slapping our faces. 
I got to ride in the back of the Jeep on a homemade seat that refused to remain fixed in one position, and every limb that rode up over the windshield came down upon me with a vengeance. I whined more than Uncle Zeb could tolerate, and he told me to stop whining like a little girl. My first thought was to tell the old goat to kiss my ass, but I was not allowed to use language like that. Hence, I continued to whine, albeit a little quieter. We stopped at the split in the road and parked the Jeep in an open grassy spot. I bailed out of the back of the Jeep and went galloping towards the waterfall, down a ten-foot embankment into a shady glade that I thought only existed in books. The water was crystal clear and the sizable stones that ringed the pool were covered with bright green moss, and they were damn slick, I might add. Ninety-year-old men don't move very fast, and I had my shoes removed. I had waded out into the pool at the bottom of the falls, and I was searching for crawdads before either my dad or Uncle Zeb came into view. Dad tried to verbally restrain me, but he should have known better. They made their way to the edge of the pool and found stones suitable for sitting, of which there were many. This was probably the coolest place on this old mountain, being as how it was July and unrelenting heat was the order of the day in this corner of Alabama. There was actually a bit of a breeze and it had to be 20 degrees cooler than anywhere we had been on this day. I was as happy as a pig in mud. The only blemish on that thought would be the generous number of skeeters who seemed harshly deprived of nourishment and sought to replenish themselves with my blood. I hate mosquitoes, but I like the location. I could tolerate the small sacrifice of a few drops of blood for the use of this beautiful place. We hung out there for a couple of hours, and I suddenly realized that my stomach was complaining about being empty. I mentioned that I was hungry, and Dad told me to go back to the Jeep and bring back the brown paper sack that had bounced around with me in the back of the Jeep. I did as he said, and lo and behold, there was food there. We spread what was going to pass for lunch on a flat-topped rock, and I became aware of just how hungry I was. I was not, and I am still not, the guy who eats sardines and hot sauce on crackers, unless, of course, at gunpoint but that day was an exception. Ordinarily, I don't put a thing in my mouth that has a face or a detectable appendage, but hunger is a cruel master, and that principle was set aside for this brief moment in time. I'm not sure if the warm Dr. Pepper helped, but it didn't hurt. Oddly satisfied and somewhat surprised and even a little bit ashamed of having eaten the sardines, I finished off my Dr. Pepper, and I asked Uncle Zeb if he had come here when he was my age. He grinned, and he nodded his head. I asked what it was like in those days. He started describing what it was like. Back then, it was even further out in the woods than it is today. The nearest house was the better part of ten miles away, and the only people that ever came here were hunters. When Zeb was 15, he told his father of a plan to come to this area hunting with two friends. His father knew the other two boys and knew that all three were responsible woodsmen and under normal circumstances would be completely safe. His father warned him of the danger that existed at the waterfall with a conviction in his words that truly concerned Uncle Zeb. Knowing that his dad was never one to exaggerate kept Zed from completely disregarding his warning as a parental fast one. He asked for specifics, and his father told him briefly of the things in the trees. I'd never heard this before, and it sounded like a doozy of a story, and I pressed him for details. My dad almost smiled as he lit a cigarette. His first puff, you know, puff is not really the word for that god-awful and voluminous expulsion of noxious fumes that is referred to as a puff. In any case, it cleared the immediate area of those pesky mosquitoes, so apparently it's true that there's some good in almost anything. Uncle Zeb told of a hunting trip he and his friends had planned. That afternoon, they were dropped off at the point where the logging road joined the country road. It was some less than a mile up the south slope to the waterfall, and carrying all their gear proved to be a trial. 
They plan to stay overnight with the intentions of reducing the coon population in the area. They had brought along four of the finest coon dogs they could round up. Two of these dogs were celebrated and fabled for their penchant for violence with regard to animals smaller than themselves, coons in particular, and for that matter, they didn't get along so well with each other. Confidence was high among the young hunters. They spent the afternoon setting up camp and amassing a mountain of firewood. The sun was beginning to settle in the trees on the western edge of the mountain. Bacon and eggs one normally associates with breakfast, but I was informed that their evening meal consisted of these staples along with his mom's leftover biscuits. The dogs were denied any sort of meal, the thinking being that a hungry dog will try to hunt harder. They would be fed after they had fulfilled their obligation. Darkness began to envelop the campsite and the hunters made ready to seek out their prey. They primed the dogs with a coon skin from a few days earlier and set the excited animals loose. The dogs quickly disappeared into the blackness of the woods, issuing an occasional yep as they scoured the area. Zeb and his friends began to follow the sounds, hoping to stay within a reasonable distance of the dogs. They listened for the change in the sounds to indicate that the dogs had treed a coon. It wasn't long before the ruckus broke out, and they knew they had one. Zeb was on the trigger, and the other two boys were holding the lanterns. They found the tree with a swirling mass of very excited and determined dogs at its base. The boys gathered close by and took out their mirrors to direct as much light as possible up into the branches. I asked about the mirrors, and Uncle Zeb reminded me that this was when he was a boy and flashlights were all but non-existent in these parts. And with the light shining into the branches, there it was, the eye shine of a raccoon. Taking careful aim, Zeb tried to place a shot to ensure the coon would fall where the dogs could finish it off. He succeeded, and the violence began. Being knocked out of a tree with a twenty-two hollow point and then swarmed by a pack of bloodthirsty dogs has to be a bad way to go. Four coons met their fate that way on that particular night and got to ride in the potato sacks brought along for just that purpose. The proud hunters fought to get the dogs on their leashes and they headed back to camp. They had covered a considerable distance. The dogs, who had been zeroed in on the sacks hanging from the boys' shoulders, were suddenly distracted by something in the woods. A hundred yards to the right was the very top of the south ridge of the mountain, and the rising moon made it possible to see the silhouettes of the millions of limbs and the thousands of trees. The dogs were raising hell about something, so the boys set them loose just to see what it was. The pack tore through the woods straight up the slope towards the top of the ridge. The boys followed, thinking that they would likely get another coon. As they neared the top of the slope, the dogs grew silent and very quickly returned to the side of the hunters in a most sheepish manner. They whimpered and they sat as close to the boys as they could. This was very strange. Two of these dogs would fight a buzz saw, and all four were most definitely scared of whatever was up there. First thoughts went to a mountain lion or a bear. This was not good. The boys had been told that these dogs would go after a bear, so it would seem that the thing that had sent them packing probably could kick a bear's butt, and no one wanted to get involved with something like that. A discussion broke out, and the overwhelming consensus was to get the heck out of there, though curiosity weighed heavy on everyone's mind. The dogs seemed pleased with the decision to retreat. En route, they stopped a number of times to look behind them, just to be sure they were not being followed or possibly stalked. Once, while checking the rear, the outline of the trees was backlit by the moon, and one of the boys said with great conviction that he saw something moving in the trees. They all stood there staring at the ridge, and there it was, movement in the limbs. 
It was way bigger than any coon that ever lived on this mountain. It moved again, and then again. This thing was likely the size of a grown man. Its outline was clearly visible as it stood on two legs on a limb and peered directly towards the boys, who were less than 50 yards away. Frozen in time, the boys mumbled to each other, trying to figure out what this thing was. Suddenly, another one appeared there beside the first one. Then another came in from the opposite direction. They moved as nimbly as any squirrel ever did. Uncle Zeb said that he had never been so scared in his life. He had thought to use the rifle to kill or at least frighten these things away, but a bolt-action twenty-two was not going to stop something the size of one of these things, or, more likely, it would make it mad and no one knew what their capabilities were. These things could be meat-eaters for all they knew. That was a frightening thought, and there appeared to be a number of them. It was time to go. The boys hurried down the slope towards their camp. When they arrived, the camp had been ravaged, and their gear was scattered all over the area. They stood looking around at the mess left by whoever or whatever had been there. The sound of a limb breaking high in the trees got everyone's immediate attention. There was a rustling above them coming from more than one direction. The light of the campfire was enough to produce eye shine from several places in the trees above them. Nobody screamed, but everybody was fighting the urge. They hurriedly grabbed what they deemed most important and scrambled down the narrow pine straw-covered road towards the county road at the foot of the slope. It was a long walk in the dark down that dirt road, but they finally arrived at Zeb's house, where they bedded down in the barn to wait for morning. No one looked forward to being known as the guy who cut and ran from a troop of three monsters. Who's going to believe a story like that? Days later, after much discussion, they returned to recover whatever was left at the campsite, and they were accompanied by Zeb's father and two other men with shotguns loaded with slugs and buckshot. Most of the gear was undamaged. It had just been scattered. The men were asking a lot of questions and obviously had some doubts about the answers they were getting. Zeb pointed up to the trees directly over the campsite as he explained the situation. He noticed a limb that had been broken off the tree and was hanging on another limb and pointed it out to the doubters. It was far too high in the tree to have been easily accessed by the boys. This was not a prank. Uncle Zeb said that that was the last time he had been to this place before today. I was actually stunned. Naturally, I started looking up into the trees with a look of genuine concern on my face. I asked if anyone had ever killed one of these things. Uncle Zeb looked at me with a completely solemn expression and said, Of course, they were all killed. Naturally, I asked, Well, who killed them? My dad turned his head away from Uncle Zeb and said, Reverend Riley killed them. He came up here on Saturday and preached them to death. My dad couldn't hold it in, and he burst out laughing, followed by Uncle Zeb. That old man's lack of religion bordered on disrespect. I thought about kicking his ass, but I didn't know for sure if I could handle him, and besides, the longer I waited, the funnier it became. More than once before Uncle Zeb passed away, I asked him if there was any truth in the story of the things in the trees. Each time, he gave me a look that I had never seen from him at any other time in my life. Not a word of confirmation, though. His words left me unsatisfied, even a little confused. His expression was somewhere between a serious warning to stay away and a challenge to find out for myself if there were things in those trees. Now, the question is, do I have the nerve to spend a night at that waterfall? And then he signs off, and this is just a great story. I don't know why, but I love these stories that are told by our grandfathers. I used to listen to my grandfather tell stories constantly, constantly. I mean, I would just sit on the couch with him in the summers or out on the porch and just listen to him tell story after story after story when he was a kid. And there's something about it that just enthralls a young kid 
And we don't forget those stories. We just, we don't forget them. And this is one of those, and I'll remember this one. It was really great. So to the writer, thank you for sending it. Thank you for passing on a family story. I thought it was awesome. Uncle Zeb sounded like a great guy. He'd have been a fun guy to hang around as an 11-year-old. All right, buddy, I appreciate it. Here's an email from Rocky. Rocky writes, back in 1982, I was a member of the Army National Guard. I was in a mechanized infantry unit in Pennsylvania. We were deployed to Virginia for our two-week annual training. We rode around in armed personnel carriers, APCs, throughout the swamps and deployed at different sites and disembarked from the APCs and we would set up a security perimeter. On occasion, we would be a part of a recon team to go out and scout the area, but most likely we would just form a 360-degree perimeter around the APC and stay in that area for several hours until our next mission. The area was swampy and muddy with mixed forest and some clearings. There were a lot of bugs and small wildlife, but when our APCs were moving into the area, the wildlife would clear out. We all carried weapons, but we had no ammunition, and we were just training in the area. On one occasion, I was on security, and I was stationed a ways off from the APC, maybe about 50 yards. The brush was thick, and it was just about out of sight of where I was positioned. My position was overlooking a field with short brush and some mixed larger trees. I was looking over the area and observing what was out there, making a mental note of the trees and the terrain, etc. After a while, I was starting to notice all of the terrain was merging in my mind and in my vision. It looked all the same. I attributed this to myself getting sleepy, so I refocused and moved my eyes around again to get a sharper view. The area was quiet, and I didn't notice any sounds. In the back of our minds, we knew that this was a training exercise and there was no real enemy, but we had to remain sharp. Other members from opposing teams would cross into our area and we would have to observe them and send back a report. I kept observing the field and all of a sudden I felt something call out to me. I felt like somehow someone was trying to communicate with me and at the same time, I didn't hear anyone. I thought it was maybe another team member, but we had to try to remain hidden and silent. I refocused on the area in front of me, and I saw what is best to be described as a large gray gorilla in the midst of the field eating bamboo stalks. I had never had any experience with Bigfoot before, and I thought that maybe this was an actual Bigfoot. Back at the assembly site when we first got to the fort, a few of the other soldiers who were there from prior week's training would say that they had seen Bigfoot and had some run-ins with them, but they were laughed at by trying to frighten the younger soldiers. But here in front of me, I was watching a large Bigfoot eating bamboo stalks and it was looking at me. It was built like an oversized football player. Its height was probably five to six feet tall. It was looking at me and slowly turning its head around, observing things in the area. It was quietly eating and just watching me. I didn't notice a foul smell. Maybe I was upwind from it. I felt like it continued to speak to me by mental telepathy. I couldn't remember specifically what it said, but it was communicating to me, and it was a peaceful communication. It did not make any noises except for when it slowly raised up and walked away from me into the distance. When it stood up, I finally realized how massive it really was, probably eight feet or more. It had long arms covered in gray hair, and it had a human-looking face, but somewhat of an ape in appearance. It was a peaceful experience. I saw no features that it was a female, so I assumed it was a male. I felt like he was trying to peacefully say to me, Hey, I'm here, I see you, and I'm just going to continue eating, and then I'm going to leave. The whole encounter lasted 15 to 20 minutes. 
and there I stood in a trance, yet still fully awake. The mental messages I got were that he knew that he was safe with us, and he knew that we had no ammunition. He had seen us many times before. If he had wanted to attack or hurt us, he could have easily done so. I felt that we should leave them alone, and that we were in his living room, and that we should respect his area. I didn't tell anyone about the experience for a long time, and I kept it to myself for many years. I did study up on the creatures, and I was intrigued. There were other times in my life that I figured I had come across other encounters, but I never saw one again. When you have an encounter, you know what to look for. I hope to see another one under the same peaceful conditions. I know that all are not peaceful, and some can be wild and aggressive if provoked. They only want to live in peace and stay away from humans, and I don't blame them. I have to say to anyone out there that if you are not a believer, please don't laugh or ridicule or embarrass anyone who tells you their Bigfoot encounter. They may be perplexed or even confused, but have faith in them. Once you have seen one, you are a believer. You know what you've seen. How can you not believe this world is so vast that there are thousands of acres of land out there that no one has ever set foot on? We cannot be arrogant thinking that we know all there is to know about this planet when there are places that we've not explored yet. Just think about the oceans as well. Science is not all-knowing. We are just a small part of this world, and there are species out there that we will never know about. I've had friends who have claimed to have alien encounters. Now, I have never experienced this, but I don't discount their experiences. We all need to keep an open mind and be accepting. This is the only way that we can grow. Thank you, Dixie, for letting me tell my story. I love your channel and story. Sign Rocky. Rocky, that's a great story. I don't, um, I mean, you, <laughs> this encounter kind of reminds me of that Bob Gimlin film that I, or video that I recommended you all go see in the last video. Uh, if you hadn't seen it, go over there and look at it, but it's the, it's a Vancouver Island Bigfoot. You were just sitting there and this thing was eating, just sitting there moving around eating and it was gray. And that one in the Bob Gimlin film was gray too. So that's interesting stuff. I don't know how to get people to believe you know, you almost have to be a an evangelist for Bigfoot to get to convince people that this thing is real. And I, I really honestly wouldn't even try. And there are people who don't think Bigfoot is real. And I understand that perfectly. There's no that's I mean, I'm a skeptic myself. I don't I don't fully believe there's a Bigfoot, but I think there's something out there. I think there's something people are seeing. And I don't doubt their stories, but I just I just I, I'm going to have to see one to 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 really be convinced of this. So, yeah, I, this world is vast and there are lots of animals and things and creatures and areas that we don't know anything about. You're right. We should keep an open mind on what, what is new and what could be out there that we don't know about. I think that's good advice. So, Rocky, thanks for the uh, email. It was really good. Really good story, man. Appreciate it. All right. Here's an email from a woman uh, she does, she's gonna keep her, I honestly, I can't remember if she wanted to be anonymous or not. So I'm going to keep her anonymous and I don't really want to go look it up. I guess I'm lazy. This is a great email. This is really a good email and it's a great story. So hold on to your weaves. Here we go. She writes, okay, I guess it's my turn to tell some cool encounters. At least I hope they are first by my sister and then myself with my daughter. My sister, in the summer of 1990, was working for a river rafting outfit in Stanley, Idaho. In her free time, she and two of her co-workers would go for hikes around the numerous and gorgeous mountain trails throughout the area of the Sawtooth Mountains. She and her friends set off on a long trek, rather longer than they probably should have, and they found themselves many miles back in behind the Stanley Lake area. After hearing a strange, unfamiliar animal sound, the group of three girls stopped and they listened. While standing still, a pine cone fell to the ground just a couple of feet away from them. A few seconds passed, and then another pine cone arched through the air, this time landing much closer to their feet. 
The girl's first reaction was to suspect that they had been followed by some mischievous male counterparts at the rafting company, but upon calling into the woods, they received no reaction, no laughter, nothing to indicate human tomfoolery. They lapsed back into a nervous silence. And then another object, this time a pebble, and this landing even closer. Then that strange animal call came again, the sound that had stopped them in the first place. And with a growing feeling of unease, the girls decided it was time to leave. The three of them hightailed it out of there, but not too quickly. Running just instinctively felt like a bad idea at the time. Later in years, as an undergrad at BSU, I was doing some research on a local horse mutilation with the full intention of debunking any alien nonsense. I found myself lured into the realm and research of other strange regional occurrences. In my investigations, I was referred to and consulted with Dr. Jeff Meldrum of Idaho State University. He is the professor of anatomy and anthropology at the university and is an expert in foot morphology and locomotion in primates. During our conversations, he asked me if I was familiar with unclassified hominids in the mountainous regions of Idaho. I said, no. What do you mean, Bigfoot? I laughed in my head, but by the time he was done with me, I was completely flummoxed. This man was a level-headed, straightforward academic with no interest in swaying my beliefs, but simply laying out the facts. And they were some pretty good facts. I was working toward a degree in science myself, and I was baffled to hear such a no-nonsense academic take on a subject that I had always thought was, well, to put it bluntly, sheer bullshit. My natural skepticism in the face of these legitimate arguments started a firestorm of insatiable curiosity in my brain. I had to know everything there was to know about this subject, and so I proceeded to snarf up all the information I could, arguments both for and against, and as infuriating as it was, the fors continued to outweigh the against. It was mind-wrenching. And on top of all this frustration, all the while I'm trying to keep my interest in the topic as incognito as possible. I soon realized that maybe my incognito needed some work. Skipping forward a few more years, my teenage daughter had gotten into an argument with her science teacher about Sasquatch and proceeded to write a very coherent and scientific analysis of the phenomenon. I have to hand it to my daughter. By the time she was done with her presentation, her teacher in any of the class that could still talk with their mouths hanging open agreed that she had presented a very compelling and convincing argument. Her teacher actually called me to compliment me on my daughter's presentation. Come put that in your pipe and smoke it lecture. He said he had a whole new take on the subject. The summer after the school presentation incident, my daughter was now fully apprised of the many aspects of the Bigfoot phenomenon, including the whoops and different vocalizations. A little background info for the rest of the story here. Stanley Lake is in a relatively remote area of the Sawtooth National Forest in Idaho, and it is one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. It is surrounded by sweeping mountains on all sides, with camping access on only one side of the lake. My husband and I decided to go camping at Stanley Lake in the summer of 2017, one last time before the Forest Service restricted lakeside access to all campsites at Stanley Lake. In fact, the bulldozers were working through the day while we were there, building new campsites further up and far away from the lake and destroying the old ones that touched the shore. The camp host informed us that we would be the last people to camp in the campsite, my favorite since I was a child, and I actually started to cry. But now, for sure and by God, we were going to enjoy this last hurrah. 
With our camper, two kids, two dogs, and four kayaks to the soon-to-be-extinct spot and set up camp. We kayaked, we hiked, and we kayaked some more. We grilled food over the campfire coals. We watched meteor showers at night from our kayaks on the lake. It was absolute nirvana. The second to the last day on the lake, my daughter and I set out, just the two of us in our kayaks, while Dad and our son did some fishing on the bank. We paddled all the way over to the isolated side of the lake. No roads gave access to that side of the lake at all. We puttered around in a stream outlet, getting out to snoop into the trees, walking up and down the bank in the trees where very few people ever venture. We tried not to spook the wild geese and ducks that puddled along the bank, bobbing up and down for snacks on the bottom. It was so tranquil and beautiful. Finally, we headed back to our kayaks. We got in and started paddling back. My daughter was just a few paddle strokes in front of me. Suddenly, I heard a noise in the trees, a very long, distinct, resonating, echoing sound. It carried across the water and echoed off into the mountains on the other side. It took my mind a second to process the noise, and just as I did, my daughter spun around in her kayak and almost capsized trying to come around to face me. We stared at each other in shock, and then at the same time we both said, that was a whoop. We both knew what whoop we were talking about. The low, drawn-out, to high call of the illustrious North American unclassified hominid Bigfoot. We sat frozen in stunned silence when another whoop sounded off, this one from a different location further up the mountain. I almost screamed in delight, sharing gleeful glances with my daughter and looking around for anyone else to share this amazing moment with, but it was just the two of us. I wondered if any of the other campers around the lake, who surely had to hear those calls, had a clue what they were hearing. And then came the doubt. Was it really a whoop? And then came the reality. Yep, it was most likely a whoop. We had both spent an unnatural and probably unhealthy amount of time listening to vocalization recordings. I have camped all my life. I have many memories of camping and many memories of tree knocks. Yes, lots of tree knocks. I never thought a thing about them. I always assumed it was some kid with a stick or somebody trying to break up firewood. Now I wonder. All those knocks over all those years. Certainly not all of them were Bigfoot, but how many actually were? And probably whoops, too, because the whoops my daughter and I heard at the lake were somehow familiar to me, I've heard them before and over the years. I just never realized what I was hearing. Last week, I called my sister. I had to tell her. I know she is a skeptic, but I had to tell her. A segment in one of your videos gave the best eyewitness description of the mid-tarsal break in action that I had ever heard. It was in Marathon 89, and the time stamp is 29 minutes and 35 seconds in which the Australian recon group described the Yowie wrapping his foot over a log, using, as Dr. Jeff Meldrum had taught me, his mid-tarsal break, a joint in the middle of the primate foot that humans lack. It helps the unclassified hominids walk easily in difficult terrain, straight up hills, probably up trees, over rocks and logs. I called my sister because I was so excited. I had just forwarded your video to Dr. Meldrum with the time stamp. What? You sent my video to Jeff Meldrum? Oh my gosh. What? With the time stamp of that awesome mid-tarsal break in action descriptive, not many people even realize that Sasquatch has a mid-tarsal break and what a compelling bit of physiological substantiation it is for the existence of these creatures. And that soldier spelled out the dynamics of its movement like butter. I had to share it with Dr. Meldrum. Oh my, I can't believe that. Jeff Meldrum may, may 
I, I, I stress may have listened to one of my videos. My sister and I continued to talk as sisters do, and she relayed again to me her adventure in Stanley, still with the edge of skepticism, and that was so weird, but it just can't be, in her voice. I then proceeded to reiterate my and my daughter's kayaking experience to her. I was sure I had probably already told her the story. It turns out I had, only this time she asked me to do the whoop. What does a whoop sound like, she said, so I did my best, and probably sadly inadequately, my version of the whoop. The line went silent. I finally said, are you there? And then I heard my sister's voice say, oh my God, I just got chills. Why, I asked. That whoop that you just did, that was the sound that we heard on our hike in 1990. I forgot all about it until you just did it, and then it came screaming back, replaying in my mind. That was the sound we heard before the pine cones and the pebbles started falling. I asked, did you hear any tree knocks? There was more silence across the line. And then she said, damn it, I'm a skeptic. You know I'm a skeptic. You have messed with my inner skeptic. My inner skeptic is now confused. Just guessing here, but I'm thinking she may have heard some tree knocks. And then the writer writes off the end. <laughs> oh, you girls write so good. Girls, women, I'm sorry if that offends you if I called you a girl always. I don't know. It's just a habit. But what a great story. And I could tell. Can you guys not tell the excitement in these letters sometimes? Some, some letters are just kind of describing an event. Some letters are animated they're animated they're, they come to life it's like the words jump off the page and you're there with the people and i was there with this family and this woman and her daughter hearing these things and i was there kind of eavesdropping on the conversation between her and her sister and i loved it i absolutely loved it and thank you ma'am for sending a link to my video to dr jeff meldrum he's like a rock star in this bigfoot thing and on skepticism, I'm a skeptic too. And I get the same feeling whenever I see really, really good evidence. For example, those tracks that the, the beast people that I, I referred you guys in the last video to their Facebook site. They have a YouTube channel too, where they do beast, T, uh, beast TV. It's a weekly live video where they interview other researchers and people who have had encounters. It's an hour to an hour and a half long show. You guys should really tune into their YouTube channel. I'll put a link. I'll put an end screen on this video so you guys can click the video and see what they're doing over at Beast. But back to what I was saying, I'm a skeptic. And when I see stuff like these tracks that these guys found at the land between the lakes, it messes with my inner skeptic. It bothers me. It creates a real uncomfortable tension in me because if I, it's like if you don't keep ingesting this information and these uh you know the credible evidence the evidence that actually look real looks real i'm not talking about blurry pictures i'm talking about real tracks real videos where you can actually see something going on it messes with you and you're like oh my gosh i just spent two weeks or two months and i didn't see anything of any significant these this is all a bunch of bull crap and then something like these videos with these tracks at the at the bee sawdust beast team it's like <laughs> they're real they're real tracks it's unbelievable it's just unbelievable and that's what i love about this topic it's like this constant tension and release and tension and release and it's constant mystery, and in some ways, I kind of hope it stays a mystery because that's what makes it interesting to me. If we ever capture one or kill one or have a specimen, it's like, <laughs> we're just all going to know everything about it at that point. Okay, I'll quit running my mouth here. Let's get on. Hey, thank you guys for listening to the video uh, this far. I really appreciate it. And we'll. I think I'm going to have a an interview I had with a man up in um, up north next. I'll have that edited and up in a couple of days. I think you guys will really like it. But we'll see you guys on that video. Okay, hope you have a good weekend. Thanks. Down.